1847, Springfield, Massachusetts. Frederick Douglass is fascinated. He'd come to this house at the owner's invitation, curious about the one white member of the black church where he'd just given a lecture about his life under slavery. Now, when he's had dinner with white abolitionists in the past, it's usually at fine houses, and it's awkward. But this man, John Brown, lives in a house more modest than Douglas's own, and his family is so used to having black neighbors for dinner that there's no hint of tension. The table is full of lively conversation and gentle prodding. Yet after dinner, when Brown sends his daughter upstairs, telling her that Papa cannot sing her to sleep tonight, the conversation changes. Brown tells Douglas that he believes slavery is evil, unnatural, that the enslaved must take violent action in their own emancipation, and that he, John Brown, is willing to lay down his life in the effort. Douglas has heard white abolitionists make this claim before, but this time, he believes it. Thanks so much to Factor for keeping us well-fed on a busy schedule. John Brown's meeting with Frederick Douglass, the most famous black orator of the abolitionist era, was no mere happenstance. In fact, Brown had intentionally moved to the abolitionist center of Springfield in order to deepen his knowledge and contacts in the movement. He'd also been offered a job tending sheep, and, well, he needed the work. Turned out, Brown was talented with animals, and if he'd stuck to those trades, he probably would have kept financially stable. But instead, he kept pouring money, both his and loaned from friends, into bad ventures. By 1842, he had to declare bankruptcy and was tied up with lawsuits. Sadly, this run of financial misfortune came at the same time as personal tragedy. In 1843, four of his youngest children, aged one to nine, died in a dysentery outbreak, and he'd lose three more children in the next decade, including one to a terrible kitchen accident. Yet amidst these financial and personal catastrophes, he was pushing forward in another area, that of abolition. He and his sons continued to smuggle people north as part of the Underground Railroad and used his business travels to establish a network of contacts among free blacks in the north. And in that work, he encountered a more militant brand of abolitionism that, preached by those who had actually been enslaved, did not consider violence to be contrary to the cause of emancipation. When he moved to Springfield, he joined a black Congregationalist church, embedding himself in the black community there. He hired black residents in his wool business and secretly met them before and after work to discuss freeing slaves. Not just through the Underground Railroad, mind you, but through direct liberation. He also saw lecturers like Sojourner Truth and Frederick Douglass, leading to a fateful meeting that would change Douglass's life. Whatever Douglass expected from the after-dinner conversation, this was not it. Brown told him that he was recruiting men to be an army of liberation, that he wanted to take a force of free black men down to the Appalachian Mountains and fight a guerrilla war against slavery, that he would raid for rifles and free slaves to join their ranks, much like the Haitian revolutionaries, because if black men seized their own freedom, the North would respect and support them, and they would gradually drive slavery further south. This talk alarmed Douglas. A force of armed slaves was the South's nightmare, and Douglas thought that they would marshal any force necessary to stamp it out. But the way that Brown spoke was electric. Though a white gentleman, Douglas said, he is in sympathy with the black man and is deeply interested in our cause, as though his own soul had been pierced with the iron of slavery. And though Douglas worked with William Lloyd Garrison, a proponent of nonviolent resistance against slavery, what Brown said made sense. Would these ruthless opponents really give up the chains of the slaveholder except by blood? While I continued to write and speak against slavery, Douglas later recalled, I became all the less hopeful for its peaceful abolition. My utterances became more and more tinged by the color of this man's strong impressions. And no wonder, for the national policies around slavery became even more nasty. The effort to prevent slavery's expansion had utterly failed. Texas joined the Union as a massive new slave state. Then the Mexican-American War added yet more territory that pro-slavery congressmen tried to organize into slave states, both to expand the institution and to get two more pro-slavery senators for each new state. And nine southern states even held a convention threatening to secede if slavery were outlawed in the new territory. The arguments over this led to brawls and drawn pistols on the floor of Congress and civil war was only averted with the Compromise of 1850, a complicated series of bills that admitted California as a free state to balance Texas and stipulate that the newly created Utah Territory and New Mexico Territory would only send non-voting members to Congress. This preserved the balance of power, which in the Senate was evenly split between the two factions, 
Though due to the North's larger population, the House of Representatives had an anti-slavery majority. Hmm, this all sounds familiar? But what truly inflamed the North was a bill passed as part of the compromise, known as the Fugitive Slave Act, allowing runaway slaves to be arrested in free states and returned to bondage, backed by nothing but oral testimony. It also compelled law enforcement in free states to enact and cooperate with these seizures, and anyone aiding or sheltering an escaped slave could be fined $1,000 and imprisoned six months. The act bolstered anti-slavery sentiment in the free states. Even Northerners that were lukewarm on the issue hated it, because this bill turned the issue of slavery, one that seemed like a far-off Southern problem, into one that impacted directly on their communities. It not only put a slave catcher on your street, but it made you become a slave catcher as well. Seriously, who do these slavers think they were? Most northern states refused to enforce it. In Wisconsin, it was declared unconstitutional, and in Massachusetts, Brown organized a militia known as the League of Gileadites a mixed-race armed militia that swore to meet with force any attempt to enslave its residents. Due to the League, not a single person would be taken from Springfield. It was Brown's last act before he moved to North Elba, New York, a remote community high in the Adirondack Mountains that a millionaire had started as an experiment to show that former slaves could form a functioning community. Brown settled his family there to act as a mentor, using his surveying and farming skills to advise those that needed help. Visitors found him having dinner with his black neighbors, referring to them by their surnames and the term Mr. and Mrs. in a way that was simply not done then, even by abolitionists. Though he would not stay long, for crisis once again brewed, this time in Kansas. In 1854, a bill known as the Kansas-Nebraska Act took some of the unorganized territory gained in the Louisiana Purchase and formed the states of Nebraska and Kansas. But while these states were above the line set in the Missouri Compromise, and by that measure would make them free states, the bill instead put it up to a popular vote by residents. Nebraska was safely in free state territory right by Iowa, but Kansas sat just across the border from the slave state of Missouri, meaning that most of the settlers were southern. Both sides saw the opportunity and poured settlers into Kansas for the express purpose of voting it in either as a slave state or a free state. In fact, five of Brown's sons moved there, starting an outpost known as Brown's Station. Yet the father himself, now 55, was too old to go. Plus, the 1,200 free state settlers were met by a tide of what would become known as Border Ruffians. These armed pro-slavery militias were an alliance between Missourians who had settled in Kansas and Missouri residents who surged across the border to illegally sway elections for governor and the state legislature. They voted fraudulently, stuffed ballot boxes, surrounded polling places with armed men, and threatened the lives of election officials. A later investigation found 62% of ballots were cast illegally, and in one area, ballots by non-residents outnumbered those of residents 30 to 1. The administration of President Franklin Pierce, himself pro-slavery, ratified the results anyway. Free state settlers were harassed, threatened, and intimidated in an attempt to get them to leave. Crossing Missouri on the way to Kansas, Brown's sons found that locals refused to sell them food due to their northern accents. The rigged pro-slavery legislature made it a crime to aid fugitive slaves, print abolitionist articles, or even speak against slavery. As a result of this, in 1855, Brown received a letter from his sons. They were in dire straits, surrounded by neighbors who threatened their lives. Now, they needed something even more than food. They needed guns. So John Brown loaded a wagon full of swords, knives, and repeating rifles donated by abolitionist churches and headed for Bleeding Kansas. And a countdown to a massacre had begun. And while we'll have to wait until next week to talk about that infamous series of events, what we'll never have to do is wait long to eat something tasty thanks to Factor, who we very much appreciate their understanding that transitions from serious historical topics into delicious meals delivered right to your door can sometimes be tricky. But I think we nailed it. Now, if you've heard me talk about HelloFresh in the past, you know by now how much I love to cook. But the dark truth is that life often gets in the way of me finding time to make a meal from scratch. So then I start turning to alternatives, right? But frozen meals have too many preservatives and never taste good. And my bank account seems to strongly disagree with consistent takeout orders. Well, my solution for this quandary of the ages honestly has been Factor. They're an amazing ready-to-eat meal delivery service that takes the guesswork out of breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And I have truly been enjoying them 
time for months now. I had one for dinner last night and I'm having one for lunch today. They are fantastic. Every meal is ready in around two minutes with no prep or no mess. Just good dang food right when you need it. Also, Factor gives you a ton of meal options to choose from so you can achieve any nutrition goals you're going for. Everything from keto, protein plus, veggie, vegan options, calorie smart, which I believe are meals around 550 calories or less, and just a ton more. All of which you can choose from from their tastacular rotating weekly menu that I do every Sunday. And actually, I just realized because I didn't think about this before, you can actually mix and match between all of those in your deliveries to ensure that everyone in your household gets the exact kind of food that they love fast. Case in point. Today was feeling a bit veggie for lunch, so I devoured their biryani rice with tandoori cauliflower and curry yogurt, which I'm sure, as you can tell from the look on my face right there, not only made my day just infinitely better, but actually the time I saved not preparing that meal let me play an extra run of Vampire Survivors on my lunch break, Pepino for the win, baby! <laughs> so this spring, if you want to eat better while also just being better with your time, you should head over to Factor75.com and use the code EXTRACREDITS50. That way you'll get 50% off your first Factor box. And when you do, not only will you be getting fast, tasty meals that fit your lifestyle, but you'll also be helping to directly support the content you love. Seriously, thank you. Ooh, but speaking of things that you love, I know I've said this before, but you have got to check out their smoothies. Holy heck, they are good. Again, that is 50% off your first box at Factor75.com and using the code EXTRACREDITS50. Thank you in advance. We'll see you next time. What if I told you that Ahmed Ziad Turk, Angela Valenciana, Arcolite Games, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blaine, Kuya Koi, and Skylar Holmes were all legendary patrons? I'm not kidding. 